today, let's talk about six things that can raise your blood sugar other than your food. Hey everyone, it's low carb and keto nutrition specialist Amy Berger bringing you the one and only keto without the crazy. Diet, what you eat and drink, certainly has the biggest impact, but it's not the only thing that has an impact. And this is really important for you to know if you're on a very low carbohydrate, ketogenic or carnivore diet, because you might see numbers that really surprise you compared to what you're eating. If you're eating super, super low carb, like very, very little to no sugar or starch, and your blood sugar is kind of high, you're like, what, what gives? What is going on? This is a total mystery. Hopefully, the six things I will tell you about will make it less mysterious. I have to say, well, I, I often joke, except it's not really a joke. I kind of mean it that you should not be able to use a CGM or a glucometer without first sitting through a three-hour biochemistry lecture. And, you know, CGMs, these continuous glucose monitors, are also just a regular finger stick glucose meter, can be game-changing devices. They can absolutely provide a ton of helpful feedback for how your food is affecting your blood sugar and how other things are affecting your blood sugar. But I... Over the years of working with people and seeing stuff on social media, it is very clear that there are a lot of people using these devices who don't really have a good steeping in how to interpret the numbers they see. So I am not at all opposed to people using these devices, but I really want people to be well-versed in how to interpret the number so that they are not like freaked out and terrified over perfectly normal human physiology. Let's start with the glucose. And everybody, I, I assume you know, if I say blood sugar or blood glucose, it's the same thing. I use them interchangeably. Whatever just falls out of my mouth is how I say it. <laughs> okay, the first thing that can raise your blood sugar besides what you eat is medication. There are a number of medications that raise blood sugar. Probably the most common, the most commonly used, and the one that has the most pronounced effect is steroids. And, and so those are typically, they're, they're anti-inflammatory drugs, usually prescribed for things like joint pain. And sometimes for allergies, there's a, there's a nasal spray that's an allergy spray that is, I, I, it's Flonase or, you know, when prednisone shots, cortis, cortis, cortisone shots, corticosteroid shots, or all these things. Steroid drugs can raise your blood sugar independent of what you eat. Those are not the only drugs. Some of the psychiatric drugs, I think, can affect your blood sugar. And statins, statin drugs that are used to lower cholesterol. And it's really interesting that statins are literally by the standard of care in the U.S., Statins are prescribed to people with type 2 diabetes whether or not your cholesterol is elevated. It's considered a preventive so even if your cholesterol is normal, if you have type 2 diabetes, your doctor might want to prescribe you a statin because they are following the standard of care, which is a very unfortunate standard in my opinion. But it is well recognized, well documented that statin drugs have been associated with new onset type 2 diabetes, i.e. causing type 2 diabetes in people who didn't have it before. Um, you can go directly to the FDA's website, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S., and it, it stated very clearly that statin drugs are associated with higher A1C and higher blood sugar. So that's nice, isn't it? But anyway, there. so if, if you are taking a medication that is known to raise blood sugar, there's two, two things to think about. Number one, ask your doctor about alternatives. Is there a different type of drug that I could take to address my situation that has less of a risk of raising my blood sugar? Number two is that if you're taking that medication for an issue for which a very low-carb or keto diet is, is known to be beneficial, like could possibly help you completely reverse and, and, and resolve that condition, then use that as that much more motivation to stay disciplined with the diet, to stay faithful to it, with the aim of being able to get rid of that medication someday, right? And I will say, too, that if you're on a very low carb diet, the effect of these medications is probably less pronounced than than it would be if you were eating a high carb diet, like combining, you know, a really high carb diet and a steroid medication. At least 
if the steroid medication is going to have an effect, at least you are doing what you can to keep the blood sugar down through other means. Okay, that was number one. Number two, exercise. This really surprises some people. I got an email from someone a long time ago who was doing fasted sprints, like sprinting. And they said, my blood sugar skyrocketed. What's wrong? I don't understand. And I said to this person, congratulations, your body is working exactly the way it's supposed to. When you do an all out effort, super high intensity activity, it raises your blood sugar. And I will tell you why. It is very glycolytically demanding. Glycolytic meaning splitting apart sugar, splitting apart glucose. Even on a ketogenic diet, even on a carnivore diet, that level of activity, that intensity level requires a lot of glucose. I don't care how fat adapted you are. I don't care how high your ketones are. Just the, the, the biology or the biochemistry of how that works is that that activity needs a lot of glucose. Even if you're burning a lot of fat, you also burn a lot of glucose. And if you're on a super, super low carb diet, then you know that, that glu you're, you're not getting the glucose from your food, but, but your muscles need it desperately. So where is it going to come from? Your liver is going to make it. That's what we call gluconeogenesis, the making of new glucose. So your liver being healthy and doing exactly what it's supposed to do is going to pump out a ton of glucose to give it to those working muscles that need it. So that's why during an all out effort like that, you will typically see much higher blood sugar. And I will actually show you an example of this. I'm finally getting back to a bit more exercise and different kinds of exercise. Let me show you that that says 183, 183 milligrams per deciliter. That is really high. That is like well into diabetic levels of blood sugar. And for those of you outside the U.S., 183 is 10.2 millimolars. 10.2. Yeah, yeah, it's high. And instead of freaking, guess what I was doing? Guess what I was doing when this was recorded? I was sprinting and sprinting in the heat, like sprinting in the July heat, no, no less so. Instead of, I was not scared at all. I was not worried. I was fascinated. I was seeing the physiology in action in my own body. Like this is stuff you read about in textbooks, but to actually see it like, oh, it really does work this way. And, and the, the level after my exercise was over, it came down, you know, relatively quickly, which is what we want. And I was not even worried about an insulin spike. You all know I hate the S word. I was not worried about the effect on insulin because exercise stimulates what they call non-insulin mediated glucose uptake. What? That's a big science jargon word for saying that your muscles become like sponges for glucose to the point that they don't even need insulin to take that glucose in. Non-insulin mediated glucose uptake. So even though my blood sugar was really high, my muscles were taking it up. And especially after the exercise, we're done like, oh, okay. They're just going to like suck it up like sponges. Probably that also not only was that glucose fueling me during the exercise bout, but during the time that it was still a bit elevated, but coming down afterward, all of that glucose was replacing all the muscle glycogen I had lost, all of the stored carbohydrate in the muscles. So I was not worried at all. This is exactly what was supposed to happen under that context. Now, if I had woken up with a blood sugar of 183 or 10.2, you bet I'd be a little alarmed, well, a lot alarmed, but it was perfectly expected under that circumstance. Those of you who know Dr. Rob Sivas, he goes by the Carb Addiction Doc here on YouTube. I've heard him say that his blood sugar can triple sometimes during a, a really high intense, you know, high intensity exercise bout. And where did my blood sugar start this day? It was probably like in the high 80s, maybe before I started exercising. So this basically like more than doubled. When you're in really good shape and you've got a lot of muscle tissue and you use that muscle tissue regularly, then your sort of metabolic health, your metabolic flexibility is better overall, even though during that one time it's the blood sugar's high. 
The opposite kind of happens with lower intensity exercise. Lower intensity exercise like walking or just housework, gardening, tends to lower the blood sugar. If you're starting out with a normal blood sugar, like, you know, 95 or 87 or whatever, that type of low level activity will not lower it too much. It's not going to lower it and give you hypoglycemia. But if you have type 2 diabetes, then that type of activity, again, it's going to like give give the glucose somewhere to go. So that tends to lower the blood glucose because that type of activity is not fueled as much by glucose. That low level activity is fueled more by fat. So your liver doesn't have to pump out a ton of glucose. So number three thing is stress. You've all heard of the fight or flight mechanism. Like when you, when you are really stressed out about something, your hardwired, evolutionarily wired brain interprets that as an immediate danger. There's an immediate threat. I might get eaten by a lion or, oh my God, like the, the boulder is, is coming down the hill. I'm going to get crushed. And so your liver doing you this amazing favor, pumps out a bunch of glucose in case you need to run like hell and get out of Dodge. That That's great. That served us really well a couple thousand, couple million years ago when we faced those like life-threatening, acutely dangerous situations. The problem is that here, you know, in 2025, we very rarely face those situations. Sometimes we do, especially if you're like a, a law enforcement officer or who knows what. But we we rarely face those situations. It's more like you might be in a traffic jam and you're getting really aggravated or you're you're at a tight you're up against the tight deadline at work and you feel really tense or you your boss is breathing down your neck. Just all of these other you're caring for an aging parent, like just other stressors that our brains still are hardwired to Ooh, something's wrong, something's wrong. Give me energy, give me energy so I can get my stuff done. That that served us well a few thousand years ago, it serves us terribly when our bodies are flooded with glucose and we're just sitting there behind the wheel of our car or sitting in our cubicles. But so stress can absolutely affect blood sugar. And I will show you an example of that in real life. Do you all see 154? 154 milligrams per deciliter. That is 8.6 millimoles. So pretty high, not like insanely crazy high, but pretty high, especially for someone on a very low carb diet, and especially compared to my normal levels. You know what I was doing to prompt my liver thinking that I needed all this glucose to, to prompt to 154 or 8.6? I was on a private call for a membership that I belong to, and I was about to get coached on a situation that I'm struggling with. And it was very personal and very, I was just very reluctant to open up about it. It's some stuff that I have really kept in for a long time and haven't really spoken to anyone about at that level of detail. But like, I'm paying to be in that group to get help. So I, I was just so, I was so nervous. And this was right, right before my session. So, but again, not, not worried, not a big deal. Number four, being sick having a cold, having a cough, flu, or you know, some type of acute illness or trauma or recovering from a trauma. Like if you, have you know, broke a leg or if you're recovering from major surgery, any of this type of stuff can raise your blood sugar a little bit because your immune system needs a little bit of glucose. I'm, this is the, out of all the things I had to learn in nutrition school when we did like anatomy and physiology and the different systems, the immune system is my weakest area of knowledge. It's really complicated, but there's something called a, a white white cell burst, I think, or a white blood cell burst. I could be wrong. It's been a long time, but that requires a little more glucose. So just the, the simplest way I can say it is that your immune system needs a bit of glucose. Again, even on a ketogenic diet, glucose is not the enemy. Carbohydrate is not the enemy. What we don't want is glucose that's super high all the time for no reason. You know, same thing with insulin. Insulin is not the enemy. Ask a type 1 diabetic if insulin is the enemy. You know, insulin is a life-saving drug for them. So insulin is not a problem. We just don't want tons of insulin all the time. Number five, poor sleep. Poor sleep. Broken sleep, like like short sleep, meaning you didn't sleep long enough, or broken sleep. Like maybe you slept, you were in bed for a a long number of hours, but it was like chopped up. You were up, you know, six times during the night. 
those reduce insulin sensitivity in the short term. So your blood sugar is going to be a little bit higher. I've seen this in action in myself. When, when I'm wearing a CGM, if I had crappy sleep, the next day my blood sugar will be a little higher. Not a ton, not like into diabetic levels, but noticeably higher, significantly higher than it normally is. So I have seen that in action as well. And in fact, poor sleep, broken sleep, short sleep is a risk factor for type 2 diabetes and metabolic syndrome and all that stuff. I have to say that all the research establishing that has been done in people on high carb diets. Not a lot of not a lot of people researching specifically people on keto or carnivore diets and and poor sleep and what does that do over the long term. So we don't know if broken sleep and poor sleep is as big a, a factor or a risk factor in people on lower carb diets as it is in high carb diets. But I mean, certainly, like I said, I have seen my own blood sugar be a little bit higher the following day. And everybody's going to have crappy sleep now and then. It's just like part of being human. You know, welcome to the human race. You're going to have nights that aren't so great. And that's fine once in a while. But if it's happening all the time, if you have sleep apnea or if you just for years and years, you just have really poor sleep, it could be an issue. I mean, there's there's it, it's safe to say that there is a reason we sleep and that bad things happen when you go a long time without sleeping or without getting enough sleep or enough good quality sleep. Bad health juju. Number six, the sixth thing that can raise your blood sugar unrelated to your diet is the menstrual cycle. Ladies, you might have already noticed this for yourself if you check your blood sugar regularly or you have a CGM. You might have noticed that at, at a specific time in your cycle, your blood sugar is a little bit higher, even on a keto diet. And yes, again, this effect is probably more pronounced in people who eat much higher carb diets, but it can still happen for those of us who follow lower carb diets. And I think it's a really individual thing because I know lots of people who, who do have CGMs and it's kind of like, it's just like a, a flat line almost all the time, no matter what day of the week, no matter what time of the month. So some of us might be more strongly affected by this than other people. But if you have noticed this for yourself, you're not crazy. It's not it's not all in your head like that's a, you know, and it makes sense, right? If if our our hormones change so much throughout the month, it kind of makes perfect sense that that could affect blood sugar regulation and insulin sensitivity. Hormones really do not operate in a vacuum like, oh, if this one hormone is high, then nothing else changes. Yet yeah, we wish. So it, it's like a spider web. It's like one little strand moves, the whole thing moves. So that that is a factor. Thank you for watching. Please hit that subscribe button if you're new here and you like some no-nonsense, non-crazy, down-to-earth, plain English keto talk. I mean, I know I've talked about some complicated stuff today, but I try to bring in the plain English as well. And make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Pick yourself up some merch. We've got Keto Without the Crazy merch now. There's a link in the notes to this video. And make me the promise that I ask you to make me at the end of every video these days. Until next time, keep the crazy out of your keto.